Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel House Planty Goodness and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it around me, it's Tropical Houseplant and in front of me today. <laughs> so continuing on from the review series, I'm going to be talking about the plant that you can see in front of me for the eagle eyed amongst you. This is the Alocasia miscalitiana, sometimes called Frydeck, but we'll touch on that in a minute. Now. Let's get some of the basics down for the people that are joining for the first time. The review series, the way that it's structured is I will go through certain elements of what I think is relevant to know possibly before you're purchasing this plant. I think that's usually how most people are using these reviews or possibly if they've just bought the plant just to kind of know what they've got themselves into. And um, I'll cover several things. One will be the background, how the plant came into my care. Then it will be things like speed of growth, ease of propagation, availability at the time of purchase, pests, and then some final thoughts. Now for the people that have been here around for a bit longer, I have heard your comments and I know that sometimes these intros for you might be a bit repetitive. So I've started putting in chapters so you should be able to see it at the bottom of your YouTube video screen and you can just jump straight to the first topic that you want to look at basically. But for everybody else, Another thing to bear in mind with these things is, for instance, with availability, it's going to be relevant to my situation in the location that I am, which is in the UK. So most of this will probably apply to the UK and Europe. And obviously check the date of this video, because if you're looking at this in the future, some of this data might be out of date because things move on, plants get cheaper, become more available, less available sometimes I've seen as well. And there's no two ways around this. This review is biased to my opinion because it's my plant in my environment with the care that I give it. So there is that to bear in mind. And I think that's, that's enough of an intro for this one. Let's dive into the plant itself. So as with most of these reviews, I will see about adding a picture here of what this plant looked like when I first got it. It's not an Instagram worthy picture because it's from my plant care app, so it might look a bit odd, but you can kind of see what it was like when I first got it. Let me lift up the plant and I will show you up close. And for the people that have been around for a while now, I've started doing a B-roll as well, so there will be much better close-ups of the plant at the very end of the video. But let me lift up and you can see the size of this plant and the way that it grows is a bit awkward. But as has been the request from a lot of people, because I've done a lot of reviews to begin with on philodendrons and anthuriums, I thought I'd do a different type of plant today just to kind of explain the philodendrons, anthuriums, and monsteras is what most people are searching for. So I just wanted to make sure that I was giving the review series the best chance of success. But moving on to this, and hopefully some people might be interested in this, this is definitely an allocation that a lot of people are very fond of and they do want to get. But let's touch really briefly, I've got another video which I'll link at the very top there, which I go into much more detail in terms of what I do for the care of this plant and maybe some of the background, but just really briefly, I did mention that this is sometimes called the Frydeck, or the Frydeck. And this is an interesting one because it's become the known name for this plant, but actually it's the Alocasia miscalitiana. And the Frydeck version of this plant is, at least if I'm not mistaken, is the variegated form of this plant. And it truly is beautiful. I mean, the all green form will always have a special place in my heart. The variegated one is beautiful as well. I would love to get my hands on it, but at the moment it's not hugely rare. It does come up a bit in the UK at least. It's still exceptionally expensive. So it might happen at some point soon, but this is large enough as it is at the moment. So I'm more than happy to just stay with the green one for now. But a bit of background obviously on how I got this. I think if I'm not mistaken, I got this from a local plant store. Uh, the video will have how long I've had this plant for. I'm trying to remember now if it's almost just about two years or maybe just a bit more, but the title will have that. 
And yeah, I got it as I think it was a single stem in the pot and hopefully the picture would have shown that, hopefully. Uh, it has now got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven plants in the same pot. Obviously the way that that happened is the way that it happens most of the time with alocasia, it pups, so it creates little corms around the soil and then you get more growth. Now I could have separated it out and I could have had more than one, but I don't have a lot of space. So I just thought I'd leave it in, give it a, a bushier kind of look and feel. And that's a question that I get a lot of the times uh, on Instagram on this plant. It's just like, how is it so large? And we struggle with ours a bit. I'm just like, there's quite a few plants in there. So if you get one and it starts popping out, just leave the pups in and you will eventually get a much bushier plant because you'll have multiple growth points happening on the same plant. Now this has taken a bit of a beating and it's kind of shrunk down a bit. And it usually happens for me in the winter with this plant. I will usually have it up against the south facing window in the summer, I'll maybe get a net curtain on it, but it loves light. So it does grow quite large for me when I give it that condition. Obviously in the winter I take away the net curtain, but the light level is still not particularly high. So you do see a reduction of leaves over the winter and spring, summer months, or at least I did. And now coming into spring and summer is when this will truly flourish. So I think the last time I posted about this on my Instagram, which by the way is linked in the description down below, I think it was around the middle or the end part of summer. So it was a very, very bushy plant. And I've, I've had this for a while now and that's usually what happens. So I'm relatively confident that it will become big and bushy again. The other thing about this plant, and I said this again about other allocations, is it's not a bad idea to have it slightly root bound. Obviously, if you're getting to the point where you're watering your allocations daily or every two days, it probably needs an up pot. But for me, with all my allocations, even this one, having it a bit more root bound, and I saw this somewhere in the past as well, means I will get much bigger and bushier plant. They seem to like that little bit of restriction. Obviously within reason, like I've said. But yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say about background. Let's move on to speed of growth. Now, when we're looking at the speed of growth for this plant, it's an interesting one. I kind of touched on it briefly in the difference between the winter and the summer months. And this could be true for most allocations, but as we're talking about the Miscalitiana, let's talk about that. So obviously in the winter, as I've mentioned, it does slow down a bit. I still do get leaves. And I know somebody in the past had asked to kind of benchmark it. Interestingly, this is not living in my conservatory. It's too large for my conservatory. This is living in the living room, which I'm pointing towards the living room. You can't see that, but it's over there, believe me. <laughs> and um, so it's in regular household humidity. Also in a room that for the majority of the winter months, there's a wood burner functioning in that room on a regular basis, and it's directly above a radiator. <laughs> and in a south facing window. So this gives you an idea. It, yes, it would appreciate some humidity. Don't get me wrong. Most tropical plants would appreciate the humidity, but this one seems to be doing okay outside of the humidity, especially based on the fact that this is kind of a slightly velvety feel to the leaf. That gives you a bit of an idea basically. Um, but speed of growth in the winter, I'll usually get two leaves and lose a leaf. So mm, the problem with allocations is if you don't treat them just right and kind of figure out what they want, you'll lose a leaf and gain a leaf and you never get a particularly larger plant. You just get a taller plant. Mm. But this one, again, another reason why it's good to keep the pups in with this plant as well. But that's the winter time. Benchmarking in the conservatory with a pothos, for instance, I'll get like a couple, two to three leaves, even in the winter, basically, in a month. So not a particularly slow grower. In the summer, by the way, it goes crazy. In the summer, it might double the speed of what it does in the winter, possibly even triple it sometimes. It is highly relevant to watering frequency, because it does get a lot more frequent in the summer and pests, and I will come back to pests in a minute. But yeah, relatively fast grower, winter and summer actually for this plant. So if this is one that you're thinking of and you kind of like things to go a bit faster, this is a good one to consider. 
Now, ease of propagation is an interesting one with this. And again, I've touched on this previously on previous videos when I talk about alocasias. Unlike a lot of the other aroids like the philodendrons, the anthuriums, the syngoniums even, you can't generally take a stem cutting and hope that it will grow from there. Usually the way that you would propagate is through a corn. So a corn, so the little tubers that it creates, the little progeny that's within the soil and removing that and planting it somewhere else. And I've had an okay success with this. It's no different than any other alocasia when it comes to propagating in that way. I will say, however, I saw recently, and I can't remember who it was on YouTube, it might have even been TikTok to be fair, and they were using both an alocasia and a colocasia and they were cutting the stem and actually giving chunks of the different stem and then putting it on the soil and getting that to root out and then getting more plants that way. So it probably is possible, it's just you would need a decent length of stem and I can I can pick it up and show you really quickly. So you might be able to see the stem there now. Obviously I've got a bit of length there so the cuttings wouldn't be too difficult. Now when I first got it obviously it would have been an issue but after it grows for a few years it does it does lend itself to that way of propagating. Now I will say I have never tried it that way but I would imagine it holds true and it probably would work. Uh, but I do encourage you if you want to see about that way of propagation, as I said, I've not done it, search online about stem propagation or something along those lines for alocasia and see what comes up and maybe you can get a bit of a better understanding. Also, if you've tried that and you've had success or not, let us all know in the comments down below. I'd be really interested to see because that was just in a, a video that I stumbled on and they're just like, this is how you do it. But it didn't say, I don't think it had the results. Not the video that I saw at least, it didn't have the results. I'm sure it does work, but yeah, let me know. But that's the way to propagate this, relatively straightforward. If you are doing it through the corms, you're gonna have to wait until it creates those within the soil. The one thing I will say about the root bound situation now, because I've mentioned about that in the background, uh, or background or the speed of growth, one of those two, I can't remember now. <laughs> with, um, with that, if you keep it a bit more root bound, you'll get, in my experience at least with most allocations, they will get bigger and bushier and more leaves. You won't get as many quorms because they probably won't have as much space to kind of push it out. Or if you do, they won't ever necessarily peak out because it might be too deep in the soil and there might be roots blocking it from kind of emerging from the soil. So just bear that in mind. Now, availability for this plant. Um, and again, I can talk about how it is here in the UK. I would imagine it's quite similar in the rest of Europe as well. When I first got this, it wasn't the rarest of plants. They had just started to come out on the market, at least in the UK. And I think this is because they were coming in, rather than coming in from the Far East or South America, they were actually coming in from plant nurseries in the Netherlands. And it wasn't even that expensive back then. It may have been towards the high-ish double digits. And it was, and you should have hopefully seen the, the picture from the plant care app on when I first got it. I think it probably had like a few leaves on there. It wasn't as tall. I think there was only the one corm. It might have been two um, of growth points at least. And yeah, it was maybe high double digits towards mid high double digits. This has definitely gone down a bit in price since then. It's probably mid double digits now, I would say, or maybe just below that. Because I had a friend who recently purchased this, and by recently I mean a year ago even now. Um, and yeah, it just doesn't, back then at least, it didn't come on the market as often. It would maybe come in kind of waves, so maybe once every six or seven months you'd get a batch that came out to a lot of stores. They would go relatively quickly. At least now, and again, I'm going to be hyper-local to my location. This might not even hold true for the whole of the UK. But there are at least one or two garden centers, not even just a kind of specialty houseplant store, that will get this in quite frequently now. The price, as I said, it's kind of mid to low mid double digits. But yeah, it's it's a plant that I think at least here is becoming a lot more available, which I could not be happier about. I am very much a proponent of certain plants that 
are very, very popular at this that are also not particularly difficult to care for. I mean, no more difficult than other allocations or collocations. Um, becoming a lot more readily available and a bit more affordable for the average person, especially when you get kind of stunning leaves like this one. The thing I will say as well, I mentioned that friend that bought it recently, they'd never had an alocasia before and this was their first alocasia. And she's actually managing to keep it alive and relatively happy. She's got a few questions to keep going backwards and forwards, but she is keeping it relatively happy and it even bloomed for her as well. So yeah, that's another thing to kind of bear in mind there that you could say, look, maybe try another allocation first before you go on to this one, but it's no more difficult. At least it hasn't been in my experience than any other allocation. And if I'm not mistaken, I have done an allocation, general allocation care video, and I will link it again up at the top there where you can kind of see a bit more about what I do to care for my allocations. Moving on to pests. <laughs> can you guess what I'm going to say in this area? So you might be able to see, and I'll see if I can bring a leaf up that has got, can you see the slight discoloration on that leaf? And let me see if I can bring it in closer. I will get this on the B-roll as well so you can see it. There you go. So you can kind of see that speckling that's happening there and that kind of slight yellowing that's happening there. <laughs> as with all allocations, Spider mites are not going to be your friend with this plant. They can grow. I have found that generally with this plant, they won't grow as fast as they might do on certain other plants. But yeah, it's, it, is, it is what it is. Basically, with most allocations, you'll kind of get spider mites. Now, I'm trying to take off the little tea baggy thing. So this time of the year now, and for the people that have been here for a while, this is beneficial insects. So these are predatory mites for spider mites. And usually around this time of the year, is when I start plopping them all onto every single alocasia I've got in the house or any other house, house plant that does kind of suffer a bit more from spider mites. I will pop that on because this is a time when it starts proliferating. And to be fair, I had treated this about a month ago. And even when I was bringing it in to show you, I've realized there's a lot more spider mites. Anybody else find that really annoying sometimes when you deal with certain spider mites, especially if you're not wiping the leaves after you've sprayed it down with something like neem, like a neem oil solution, for instance, and you go back and it's just like, it wasn't that long ago. Are these alive or are they dead? I don't know. Um, the one thing that I have found helps me a bit with that, and I don't know where it is at the moment, so I'm trying to think, of, there's a little drawer set down below, and I'm trying to think if it's there, I don't think it is. But there is something that um, I first heard of in Jane Perone's On The Ledge podcast, and I kind of swear by it, especially when it comes to spider mites, getting a jeweler's loop, I think it's called. So it's a little magnifying lens that jewelers will have. It's usually quite small. There's a bit of a light on it. And using that to shine that little bit of the light and kind of magnify, you can kind of see what the situation is with the spider mites. So for instance, in that situation, are they dead? Are they alive? And then act accordingly, basically. But as with anything, touching a bit actually on the pest control with this one, because the main pest that you're going to get on this is spider mites. I'm trying to think now, this may have had thrips. At some point it wasn't, <laughs> it's not like a Monstera where it would go crazy with thrips. But definitely spider mites will be the biggest one for this, as it is generally with most alocasia. And to be fair, you can kind of avoid it by getting the watering just right. I usually, if I'm going to get spider mites on my allocations, it tends to be now when the season changes, but before I've had a chance to kind of adjust the water requirements a bit more to the allocation. Usually by the time the summer rolls in, obviously I've got the beneficial insects and the predatory mites, they'll do their jobs, but it's, it's that seasonal change. And usually the same thing goes between summer and autumn as well. So it's when the watering changes where you'll get a bit more, at least it has been in my experience specifically with this plant, more of that pest pressure. Usually when that passes, it tends, and you've dealt with it, <laughs> it tends to not be as much of an issue. But for anybody who hasn't used the satchels of predatory mites before, the one thing that's highly advised is regardless of whether or not you're using neem or a systemic or any other kind of pesticide on the plant, hold off from introducing any kind of beneficial insect for at least two or three weeks 
because then the issue that you might get is you get the beneficial insects on the plant and the pesticide that you've put on for the pests is also killing the beneficial insects. So just hold off for a tiny bit if you can and then deal with that then. Uh, another thing to bear in mind with predatory mites, you can either get them in a satchel and put them on and they'll kind of deal with the spider mite infestation before it kind of happens, so a bit more preemptively. If you have a full-blown infestation, obviously I would say at that point either treat with a pesticide or a neem oil solution or whatever, or you can actually get, uh, at least here in the UK, you can get these little tubes of a lot more of the predatory mites and you then dust your plant over where the spider mites are and you introduce the spider mites at that stage directly on the pests basically the um, sorry that you introduce the mites yeah the predatory mites on the actual spider mites itself the satchel is a bit more of a slow release situation so to bear that in mind but yeah i think that's everything i wanted to say about pests let's move on so closing off with some final thoughts on this plant you might be able to guess where i'm going with this one so I'll start with the usual question of knowing what I know now would and not having this plant, would I purchase this plant? 100%. Possibly, it's, I'm looking at the other allocation up there as well. Joint first place between this one and my Gagiana variegata allocation. But very, very, very cool allocation. And definitely, and it's an interesting one as well because if you've been collecting for a while, we get into plants that maybe everybody else who isn't a plant person would be like, ah, it's just got a green leaf, why are you so excited? This is an interesting one because I think, at least from my experience and from what I've heard from friends who have got this plant, it is definitely a bit of a wow plant. Uh, even when they get friends or relatives coming to the house and they're really not into plants, this is the one plant that most people will be like, ooh, that's really cool, or what is that? So it's definitely an attention grabber. And I mean, the leaves, I think it's because it looks so unique in relation to a lot of other plants as well. So definitely one that I would purchase again in a heartbeat. Um, and then the other big thing that I will usually do in terms of scoring, so from a score from zero being the worst, 10 being the best, for this, and I'll give two scores for this one, for this as a house plant, I would give it a six or a seven. I might be being a bit harsh there, but it's highly unlikely that I would give a very high score to an alocasia because of just the slightly intricate kind of nature of getting used to how you need to treat an alocasia so it doesn't cause you stress. So I wouldn't ever give it a big score for that. In terms of zero to 10 in relation to other alocasias, I would probably give this a nine or a 10. No surprise there. But yeah, I think with alocasias, I would always be a bit more critical purely because I know it's another one of those plants like the prayer plants and the calatheas and I get a lot of flack for like, I don't diss the calatheas or the prayer plants. I'm just saying, if you're just getting into things, maybe a calathea or a prayer plant, even though it is beautiful and it's relatively affordable and you can get one relatively easily, maybe don't make that your first plant because generally speaking, they're a bit more dramatic and a, they need a bit more attention. But, sorry, off topic there, but I just thought I'd share my two cents. But alocasia is another one of those things that if you're just getting into it, maybe do try getting a very cheap alocasia, see if you can keep it happy and, and you'll kind of get used to its care, especially if you've never had an alocasia before. If you have and you're comfortable with them, no brainer, basically, you probably already have this in your collection. But, um, but yeah, and I think this is one of the plants now that I've kind of featured that is not as rare of a plant or as unattainable as some of the other ones that I've done in this review series. And hopefully that means that you might have some of your own reviews that you might be happy to share down in the comments below. But yes, please do if you have. I think a lot of other people would like to read your experiences, not just mine. But yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say about this plant. Hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.